In this episode of Ask Paul Kirtley, we're going to talk about what to do in those long nighttime hours of winter camps. I've got a number of fire safety questions. We're going to talk about billy cans versus other stainless steel pots. And is there anything poisonous that we can mistake for the humble yet widespread dandelion? Welcome, welcome to episode 50 of Ask Paul Kirtley. Yes, we've made it to 50 episodes. And if you've watched all of them or listened to all of them, a massive, massive thank you to your allegiance, your attention, um, your interest in what we talk about on this show and on this podcast. And for those of you that are new to this please go back and have a look at the previous videos or listen to the previous podcast because there's a lot of good information there. But here's to the next 50, here's to making a century. Please keep the questions coming. And uh, without further ado, I'm gonna jump straight into the questions here. And it, this first one is from Instagram, via Instagram from Forrester Bushcraft, that's Peter Forrester. And Peter's question is, um, there's a lovely photo there. It's absolutely fantastic. We should just dwell on that photo there. If, if you're listening to the podcast, it's a lovely golden light just after sunset over the Lake District Hills. There's a little bit of cloud, but not very much. Nice blue sky, um, but looking pretty chilly and pretty frosty. And <clears throat> Peter's question is, after spending a freezing cold night in the hills above Buttermere, we awoke to a crisp, clear day and a fantastic sunrise, totally worth the troubles of the night before. Okay, so that might be the sunrise, I guess. Um, the night before this, we suffered two issues. Both myself and Brian, whilst we were warm, our feet, whilst dry, were freezing cold before heading to our sleeping bags. Do you have any tips for overcoming this issue when fire isn't an option and you want to sit around camp? The other issue we faced was boredom. It was dark by 5 p.m. and too early for sleep and a very long time to do nothing but read and chat in the freezing cold. How would you entertain yourself <laughs> in a similar situation? Um, and he said here, we were fine in our sleeping bags, warm enough in our sleeping bags. Yeah, that's a nice question. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, sitting around outside in the cold, you are without a fire, you are going to get cold. And um, I'm assuming, reading between the lines there, that you had separate tents or separate shelters or whatever you were, however you were bivvying or sleeping. Um, and that meant that to sit and chat, you had to be in the outdoors. So there's a question there of, do you maybe uh, want to reconsider when you're out in the winter, uh, taking those separate shelters, maybe take something that you can share and get inside so that you can spend the time there. And um, you're gonna, if you can trap some warm air around you um, just by being in it, whether it's a, a small lightweight uh, teepee shaped shelter or whether it's a more traditional um, sort of tunnel or a geodesic design tent, something that you can get into, it isn't so big, but you can sit in, um, you can take a flask of warm drink in with you or even have a jet boil in the vestibule for a, a, a brew later on in the evening. You can get in and you can get comfortable and then you can get your boots off and you can get, you can either get into your sleeping bag if you want to, or maybe put on a nice fluffy spare pair of socks. When I'm camping in the winter, um, hiking in the hills in the UK, um, and by winter, I mean any time when, it's, when it can be frosty on the ground, um, I always take a pair of socks specifically for putting on when I'm in my sleeping bag. Um, so they're gonna be dry, um, you know, at the end of the day, even with the best will in the world, um, your feet are going to be a little bit damp from perspiration, your socks are going to be a little bit damp from perspiration, and they don't really get the opportunity to dry off um, until, you, uh, until you take them off. And so um, that's one of the reasons they get cold when you're sitting around. Um, also, 
Cold feet is generally a sign that maybe you're a little bit bodily cold as well. The other thing that I take um, in winter is some sort of duvet jacket that I can chuck on, nice hat to put on and some gloves and be nice and toasty warm. But like I say, sitting around outside when you've got clear skies above and there's frost coming on the ground, you're gonna get cold and um, much better to be in your shelter. And once you're in your shelter, put your Take your, you clearly you've taken your boots off, put your fresh, uh, warm, fluffy socks on and aren't too restrictive to help the blood flow into your feet. Get nice and cosy in your, in your tent. You can even put your sleeping bag over you rather than get in your sleeping bag if you, if you still feel a bit cold. And just chat and, um, you know, while away the hours in the way that you might do outside. But as you say, it's a long old time. Clearly you need to pre pre um, prepare some food and um, you know that's going to take some time in the evening before you get into uh, into your tent you know when I'm at that time of year what I typically try and do is be pitching my uh, my shelter my tarp or my tent or whatever I'm using around about dusk and then um, particularly in the hills uh, it doesn't really matter if you're cooking in the dark because you don't have to gather any firewood you're going to have to be using a stove of some description in the UK hills and so I have all everything that I need with me. I have my fuel, I have my food. I can do that in the dark. So I make the most of the time walking, set up um, camp just as it's getting dark and then cook. And then that's probably gonna take you till six o'clock in the evening, possibly maybe a little bit earlier, depending on how early it gets dark. And then you've got the rest of the evening to spend. Yeah, you can chat, um, but then if you, if you run out of things to talk about, um, then, uh, Reading is good, writing a diary, write, writing a journal is good. Both of you guys, this is specific advice for you, both of you guys have got YouTube channels. Great opportunity, get away from it, a little bit of a, um, away from your normal circumstances, a great opportunity to brainstorm on what you might do for the coming year in terms of ideas for your channels, um, ideas for things you might write about. Um, if you write for uh, a blog or you write for a magazine or whatever it is that you do, those times I find really useful for that sort of thing that I'm freed from external distractions. I'm freed from um, any pressures on my time. And that's a good time to be creative with ideas about whatever it is that you do. And in your cases, um, you could apply that energy to ideas for videos for YouTube channels, for example. Um, so that would be some advice. Um, and if, if you run out of, um, you know, if you're on a, on a longer trip and you've, you've exhausted your ideas bank, as it were, um, then, you know, the other thing that I quite like to do that is time consuming. Um, I normally do it when I'm driving, but it is an option to do it when you're in a tent in, in the dark as well. And you would just sort of more hours than you have uh, than you need for sleeping is listen to some podcasts, um, you know, long form content that you can listen to. Um, you can even download radio shows as podcasts. So listen to interviews, listen to documentaries, um, good opportunity to do that. Um, audio books as well. If you, um, if you don't like reading, um, audio books are great um, in terms of whether it's biography or novels um, and get lots of sleep. You know, often we don't, I personally, I don't always get enough sleep when I'm working because I'm going from one thing to the next to the next and um, I've got deadlines and I'm trying to get things done in my business and then I'm running courses. And, you know, sometimes it's nice just to not have an alarm, you know, not have to um, be woken up, wake up naturally. So if you go to bed early enough and sleep, wake up naturally, that does you a world of good as well. So my winter camping experiences are always very much centered around actually enjoying the fact that I've got plenty of time in the evenings because there is less pressure around it than there often is in normal life. So those are some of my thoughts around that. So hopefully they're useful uh, to you and maybe to some other people as well. And uh, enjoy those, uh, those moments when you're, when you're camping out in the hills in the winter because they're fantastic. Okay, fire safety questions. Now this one is from John Moseman and it's a little bit naughty. This is via email and he's asked me four questions in, in the form of one question. And I think what I'll do is as I'll go through and I'll answer each one in turn. So I'll, I'll read the, that part of the question, I'll answer it and then I'll go on to the next one. Okay, so this is from John Moseman, as I say, and um, 
He says, um, thank you for providing such great info for free. I have a couple of questions around fire safety. Have you ever been in a scenario where fire has gotten out of hand? What caused it and what did you do to get it back under control? Um, I've only ever been in one situation uh, where fire got out of control and it wasn't in, um, as it, I guess, as always the case, it's not expected. So it wasn't in a camp, it wasn't a campfire, it wasn't um, uh, anywhere where we, uh, we weren't even having fires on that trip in terms of campfires, that's the interesting thing. So it was a long time ago and I was hiking with some people that weren't, weren't super good friends in the sense that I'd never done a trip with them before. Um, we were training for an event that we were doing, an adventure race that we were doing, and <clears throat> we were doing some hiking training. And we were in Scotland, and we were backpacking for a number of days. And one of the guys had done virtually no backpacking before, and he wasn't really familiar with what to do about going to the toilet. And also, one of the things with him was that the camping food seemed to make him need to go to the toilet several times a day so we'd had to stop mid sort of middle of the day for him to go off behind a, a little grassy knoll because we were up in the hills in scotland um sort of heather and grass and bog and no trees um a few rocks um so he went so we left him and we walked down the trail a little bit and i we'd explain to him what to do to to to, to dig um, a little uh, scrape to go to the toilet there, to use the toilet paper. And if it wasn't too dry in the surroundings, um, I'd explain to him that the best thing to do was to burn the toilet paper so that it wasn't left in the ground. Um, and that um, it was, you know, all left on the surface because it's, you know, it, 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 it's, it's just litter. And it's, if it's left in the ground, it doesn't decompose very quickly, unlike the, uh, the fecal matter, which will decompose quickly. Um, and if not, if neither of those things were, if, if burning wasn't an option, um, then to put it into a Ziploc bag and, and bring it along until he could dispose of it. So we were waiting and waiting and waiting. And I went, myself and one of the other guys went back up the trail a little bit to see this guy sort of waving his arms at us from about 100 meters back up the trail. And then we could see a little bit of smoke um, coming from near where he was and we suddenly clicked as to what the problem was so we went we dropped our backpacks we went tearing back up the trail and where he had been to the toilet um, he buried his business and he'd gone to burn his toilet paper but contrary to what i said was that if it's dry don't burn it put it in a bag and, and take it and he'd set fire to some of the grass and that had taken into some of the heather and there was a, an area that was ablaze and he had no idea what to do. So we immediately uh, begun, uh, began stamping out um, any, any semblance of flame. You know, I was just horrified, you know, my adrenaline was going and, we was, and, it, and this, was, this was early in the year, this was in April, um, but there'd been a particularly dry beginning of the year. And so, um, you know, everything was drier than normal and uh, so we were stamping stuff out and the flame was expanding and we weren't catching everything and it was growing more quickly than we could stamp it out so what we then did was we took our shirts off and we started bashing the the, the flames we could stamp out a larger area for example and there was a stream very very close so we damped our shirts in the stream and we stamped the flames we damped, we smashed the flames we worked really really hard um there ended up all, all there being all four of us in the group doing that and the the fire had spread to you know it caught on material a good few meters across but we did manage and that happened very very quickly um we managed to get it under control and damp it out and then we got water and put it on um, in areas and made and stayed and made sure it was wasn't smoldering and it wasn't reigniting and uh, we managed to get it under control but that is the only time i've ever had a circumstance where a fire has um, has started uh, on, into the 
into the undergrowth or into anything unintentionally. And I've had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of fires personally. Um, I put it down to that guy's inexperience combined with probably my inexperience of explaining those things to people at that point. I mean, this is getting on for 20 years ago now. So one of those things down to experience, I'm very glad it didn't get um, any worse than it was as, as we all were. I, I know of other people like Ray Goodwin, for example, who I work with a lot. He was um, on a trip with people in Sweden and he was camping on a regular campsite. And in fact, the people uh, who had uh, been in the previous uh, village where they'd um, hired the boats from had said that they were very welcome to stay on that um, campsite at the end of the lake and they stayed on, the, on that. And um, they noticed that after having the fire for a while that smoke was coming up from the ground uh, quite a few meters away from the, the, the campfire site. And what had happened was that classic thing that you read about a lot, but thankfully you don't see very much, where fire had caught along roots of a tree and had set fire to the ground further away. Luckily, they were close to a lake, of course, being on the canoeing trip. And they also had big blue bar barrels for putting equipment in, and therefore they're able to get a lot of water onto and into the ground very quickly. Um, other than that, um, I, I have no personal experience or, or second-hand experience from people I know very well of fires getting out of hand, thankfully. And, uh, you know, I'm always super, super, super careful and, um, you know, leave no trace in terms of uh, leaving things as I find them, making sure there's plenty of water in. But, you know, my question always is, if I ever have a campfire, could I in any way, shape or form rekindle a fire from what I've got left here in terms of just bringing the materials back together or blowing on them, you know, or, you know, there's, I make sure there's no heat left in anything whatsoever before I leave a fire, um, before I move on. And if there are fire bans or if there's high fire risk, then don't have a fire. That's, that's as simple as that. Maybe you have to take a stove with you instead. Um, Second part of the question is, are there any telltale signs that a fire is getting or going to get out of hand? Um, well, you've already heard, I've already kind of answered that in terms of smoke coming from the ground away from where the fire is. And I think having read a number of accounts of other people and heard that account from Ray Goodwin, um, that is one of the classic signs that you have, a, particularly in a forest environment, you have a fire and it gets into the root system of a shallow root of a tree and it goes along like a little fuse smouldering along and it comes out in the ground nearby. Um, I've also heard of very um, uh, soft uh, leaf-based hummusy, uh, loamy soil uh, having smouldered for quite some time as well. And so smouldering away from the fire is clearly a sign that something is going awry. That's one of the reasons why you should always clear back to to bare earth. If you're going to have a fire on bare earth or have fire on, on rock, have it somewhere safe um, where you're not going to set fire to um, surrounding uh, vegetable matter, vegetative matter rather, or, or grass or, or anything. And your next part of the question, um, I guess, feeds into that part three you said if you went if you need a fire for cooking boiling water or heat when it's very windy how do you do that safely well in some circumstances you can't do it safely if it's windy and everything is super dry in the in the surroundings you are very likely going to blow sparks into a tinder dry environment and that's one of the reasons you end up with fire bans in uh, in the summer in places because the, the risk is just too high. It's also the reason why some provincial parks and national parks will say you can have a campfire, but you can't burn paper, you can't burn rubbish, because that sends, that's much more likely to send up a, a burning piece of material on the convective updraft and drop it into something that's very, very dry and start a bushfire. So if it's windy and it's tinder dry, they're the perfect conditions for bushfires and maybe you just can't you know that that's that's it you, you know it's 
out of respect of, for the environment, it's out of respect for other people, it's out of respect for wildlife uh, that may lose its life or lose its habitat um, and it's out of respect uh, for yourself because you don't want to get yourself in the middle of a bushfire because um, that could be lethal in itself. Um, but if it's windy and it's wet there isn't really any issue um, other than trying to retain the heat for yourself and then it's about making sure that you're using wind breaks um, that you're using a combination of the lay of the land and shelter um, to make sure that you retain the heat where you need it because clearly putting a kettle over a fire even just that you know regardless of getting bodily warmth putting a kettle over a fire when wind is blowing the heat sideways rather than allowing it to go upwards is going to make your cooking and your boiling and all the other things much harder um, so you need to make sure that you're using the the uh, as much protection as you can from the surroundings to try and make sure that you're keeping the heat where it needs to be. Number four, um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I see videos of popular bushcrafters lighting fires with fire reflectors and going to sleep, only to find that in the morning their fire reflector was consumed by the fire. Is this unsafe or unwise? Um, I don't think it's unsafe unless it's going to unless it's unsafe to have a fire in the first place because you know if, if the fire is going to spread it'll fire it'll it'll spread from being a fire um, regardless of the fire reflector uh, being on fire. Um, frankly, I don't I don't put a lot of store in fire reflectors and that's a conversation for not 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 for now um, in the context of this question. I think they're vastly overrated. Um, I think the best use for fire reflectors is drying and warming firewood and if you're actually going to use it for heat the best thing to do is to set fire to it frankly because you then get a grill like heat so I don't think it's unwise I actually think in some circumstances it's quite sensible um, in terms of getting heat from that wood and um, it's only going to be unsafe if it's unsafe to have a fire in the first place and normally the only time that, that there's a marginal benefit of having a fire reflector is in cold and possibly wet conditions. And as I say, you can use it to, to, to dry the external um, elements of firewood that might be a bit damp on the outside and dry on the inside. And in freezing conditions, you can use it to, to, to warm it up a little bit. So when you do put it on the fire, not so much energy of the fire is used to getting up to heat where it'll actually catch light. So. That, that's my thinking that you're probably not going to have a fire reflector in really hot dry conditions anyway so it's not going to add to any fire risk in those conditions. And that brings us to the end of those questions from John. So thank you for those questions. Um, I've got one more question on fire here from Mick Mercer um, who's probably having a bath as he listens to this as he's wont to do. Hi Mick. Hope you're enjoying your soak. Um, <laughs> his question comes via Instagram. Um, it's a photo of a fire, quite a large fire that's um, burning. It's, it's burnt down from its full extent. And his question is, um, I've had a day volunteering, um, at, at, you know, conservation volunteering, I, I believe um, is what Mick's saying. And he continues to say, and one job was to burn a large amount of wood, which we did. My question is, when is it safe to leave a fire unattended? From a bushcraft perspective, maybe thinking if you venture out from a base that has a large established fire you wish to keep in. This was a big fire and I wondered what your thoughts are on leaving it in, a state, uh, in, in the state in the photo. I didn't because I felt it needed watching for a bit and, was, and it was nice to be around. Um, but I would like to know your opinion. <coughs> Apologies for my tickly throat today. Um, well, it looks to me from that photo like it's on an area of pretty bare earth and therefore it and, and it also looks quite damp and in the background there it looks frosty in the shade and that vegetation some of it looks I can't quite see but some of it looks like soft rush which suggests that the ground in the background is somewhat damp. So I would say that having the fire where you did there was probably 
mm, absolutely zero risk of it catching fire into the ground because the ground is damp at the time of year, of course. Um, and um, the, 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 the general habitat around that was not one that would catch fire easily. Um, so I would say it's relatively safe. It would have been safe to leave that. And, and certainly I've witnessed forestry operations where they burn large amounts of brash off um, in sizes of fires that I would never have. And um, they leave them smoldering for, for days and um, it doesn't seem to spread. I would be very concerned to do that personally, but um, and I, I think it's very, I, I find it very destructive and wasteful. But that is one of the one of the practices. Um, I prefer just to leave it f to 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 go back into the the ground and provide food and habit, you know, food for fungi and habitat for insects and whatnot. But um, that's not the way some of these modern forestry practices work. That said. Um, it doesn't seem to, clearly they have a vested interest in maintaining the rest of the forest from a commercial point of view and they clearly don't worry about having big fires not that far away from their, from their commercial tree crop. So um, that's quite at, at, at the right time of year. So I would, I would suggest having a big fire in and of itself isn't an issue. Um, those sorts of sizes of fires are way beyond any size of fire that you would have in any uh, small bushcraft camp. and. Um, in terms of leaving that, um, again, it goes back to, this is why I answered your question on the back of the previous ones, it goes back to the general levels of fire hazard. Um, if, it's, uh, if it's very dry, um, then clearly there's a risk having a fire full stop, and I certainly wouldn't be leaving a fire in those circumstances, even if I thought on the margins it was okay to have a fire. Um, and if I was in coniferous woodland, where we'd been there for several days, and there was a chance that it could have got into some root system, I'd be very reticent to, to go off for the day leaving it, um, leaving it uh, smouldering. That said, I have left fires um, banked uh, so that they're in when I come back on many occasions and you just have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis that if things seem so dry that there is a significant fire risk just from dropping, say, a match into the into the leaf litter, then you probably shouldn't be leaving a fire um, anywhere unattended under those circumstances, and you should be watching it very, very cl closely. Um, and that, that's the kind of rule of thumb that I would that I would use. And when you leave the area, make absolutely sure. And this is the key thing. Um, because fires can smoulder for days, particularly in coniferous woodland where you've got a very light top level la layer of soil, you've got shallow root systems from some of the trees. That's a dangerous combination if you've left something smouldering in the ground, which is why we have those um, leave no trace practices where we make sure that we put plenty of water into the ground so that nothing can be smouldering away from where we've had the fire and then leave it as we found it as the best we possibly can um, and those are my those are my thoughts now clearly um, that's very concise and um, there are maybe particular circumstances that people want to talk about but that's a general a general thought there and then the last one on fires is from Andy and Andy asks hi Paul I'm a big fan of your channel and love the fact that you take the time to pass on your knowledge. You're very welcome, Andy. Um, his question is, once your fire has burnt out, would it be an issue to the environment in any way if you were to throw the dead coals into a stream or a creek afterwards? Thanks for taking the time to read this. Well, um, yeah, in a nutshell, it would, Andy, because <coughs> Wood ash tends to be quite alkali and throwing in, you know, charcoal and ash um, covered coals um, or dead out dog ends of, of, of wood that's been on fire is going to introduce different chemicals into the water and a lot of waterborne organisms are very sensitive to the pH level and while you doing it in a reasonable body of water is probably going to make such a marginal difference that it doesn't do anything as a practice if we all did it that it might start to make a difference and so i would say it's not a good idea to do it um, i would give you the general advice to try and make sure that you think ahead as to when you're leaving and 
make sure that you manage your fire in such a way that there's very little left before you make sure it's dead and out. And part of that process of making sure it's dead and out typically is pouring water onto it. And if you're near a stream that you could throw your dogs into, um, you'd be much better off taking water out of the stream and pouring it onto those dogs on the ground and pouring them onto ashes that are left and, and making sure that everything is cold and out in the way that I've shown in um, articles on my site. For example, there's one particular article where I show how to clean up after having a fire. But one of the key things to making sure that there is minimal mess to, to tidy up when you leave is to think ahead and don't throw big pieces of wood on not long before you're leaving because then you're going to be left with half burnt big pieces of wood that are a difficult to put out, b unsightly and um, you, you're just wasting your own efforts um, getting the wood there in the first place and then putting it out in the second place. So think ahead, plan ahead, be, uh, be thoughtful about your uses of resources, be thoughtful about how you dispose of those things and I would say don't throw them into watercourses but pull water out of the watercourse and make sure your fire site is dead and out. Billy cans versus stainless pots and this is from Arpad uh, in uh, Hungary and his question is is there any advantage or disadvantage of using a billy can compared to other kinds of stainless steel pots of the same capacity but larger diameter for example zebra billy can 14 centimeter versus tatonka kettle 2.5 i mean the main difference is the shape and i suppose a pot with a larger surface at the bottom will get more heat over the fire and boil the same amount of water in a shorter period does it make any sense it would be a con for the billy can. Are there any more points that could help decide which one to choose or shape doesn't make so much difference? Which one would you prefer? Thank you. <laughs> Regards, Arpad from Hungary. Well, good to hear from you, Arpad, and I hope to see you again before too long. Arpad came and did my intermediate course, came all the way from Hungary to the UK to do our intermediate course last year. And um, that's an interesting question. I mean, we are wedded to uh, billy cans in the bushcraft world and I guess they have a traditional uh, traditional place in uh, wilderness camping um, from the outback of Australia to uh, current day to yeah they're just you know there's the zebra billy can has become a classic you know the billy is a classic part of Australian uh, bush lore if you like I've seen old billies in museums in North America from Hudson's Bay periods and um, yeah it's just there it's ingrained in the uh, wilderness culture and it has been for a long time but there are many other types of pots and I think broad pots are particularly good on uh, modern camping stoves because the way the heat spreads from the burner and certainly you know the the classic MSR stainless pots that I had um, for backpacking for many years with use with an MSR stove they work very very well together and those um, stainless steel pots like the Coleman pots I've got some very nice Coleman pots and the Tatonka pots the stainless steel ones that are broader bottom that have got some sort of bale on them that you can hang them over the fire yeah they work well on both both on stoves and on and on fires and that's a good reason to have them because they they, they were one size fits all in that sense or one shape fits all solution whether you're using a stove or whether you're using a campfire and i think that's not a bad thing um, means you don't have to have loads and loads of kit for different circumstances but in terms of specifically about the shape otherwise it doesn't seem to make a huge difference over the fire with um, boiling times I've not perceived anything there you maybe just have to get the shallower shallower wider pots um, you have to build your uh, your pot hanger slightly differently because you've got to your height that you're working with is a little bit different but other than that um, not a huge difference in terms of boil times 
In terms of packing, they make a difference. Um, billy cans fit very nicely in side pockets of rucksacks often, but um, the, the broader, flatter pots typically don't, so you end up having to put them in the main compartment of your rucksack when a billy might fit in the side pocket, and that's a, that's a consideration potentially. And the other thing is um, a couple of uses of the pot other than for boiling, in terms of cooking stews, um, it's harder to stir a stew and stop it from sticking to the bottom of a billy can than it is to the bottom of one of the broader ones because you, you've got more material in contact with the, the broader ones and you can get in there and stir more easily and turn the, turn the contents over. Um, that's one thing that I've found. But in terms of making billy coffee um, or, or cooking pot coffee, if you want to broaden it, um, I've done it in both billy cans and the broad uh, shallower pots with the bales and I have to say that the billy can wins hands down for that coffee dropping technique that we use. Um, it doesn't work very well with the broader shallower pots because you don't get that separation of the liquid and the coffee grounds. It's much easier to get the coffee grounds to go to the bottom of the billy can which has a taller narrower cylindrical shape than the broader shallower cylindrical shape. So a couple of considerations for me. Um, so Typically I'll use a billy shape unless I'm using, specifically using a stove when I will probably choose a broader, a broader pot. That's, that's my personal choice, but I'm happy to use either. When we do canoe trips in Canada, for example, we often get all the cooking sets and everything from, from an outfitter and typically we get the broader stainless steel pots with the bales and we cook everything in those and do everything in those and we manage fine. Um, but those are my thoughts of pros and cons on those two different shapes. Hopefully that's useful. Last question about dandelions and this is from Lionel and he's from Portugal and he says I'm quite new to bushcraft and just starting to know some edible plants. Everybody talks about dandelion, but I have noticed that some plants are very similar to it. Uh, so my question is, is there any plant similar to dandelion that could be poisonous or are all of them safe to eat? Hope it's not too silly a question. Well, that's not a silly question at all. Dandelions are very common widespread plants. They have a number of uses um, for, for edible uh, purposes. Um, the leaves are edible as a salad and uh, you can make wine from the flowers, you can make a sort of ersatz coffee from the roots, um, you can even get some carbohydrate content from the roots. There are many different types of, um, of dandelion, there are a number of many many subspecies and they're amalgamated into one uh, broad species typically um, that people talk about when they talk about dandelions but there are many variations on the theme and so I don't know whether it's that that you're saying there are many plants that look like dandelion because they're all subspecies of the same or whether you're saying that there are others that look like dandelion as well because of the flower structure. Now dandelion is in the Asteraceae family which is a large family of plants which have typically have compound uh, flowers. So a thistle is a num another member of the Asteraceae. Burdock is another member of the Asteraceae. And there are, there are, and there are many uh, flowers of, of different colors, um, typically purple and, and yellow of, of that type. Um, but there are oranges as well and, and other colors. And um, there are many that have yellow compound flowers like the um, like the dandelion type flower but they're, they're the hawkweeds and the hawk bits as we would call them in English and they have a similar flower but they're typically taller plants. Um, none of them are going to poison you but I would be uh, mindful of just from an edibility from a taste point of view of making sure that you're eating the right one in that circumstance. So in terms of eating dandelions you want those nice flat um, rosettes of leaves that have got that very distinctive toothed leaf pattern. That's where the name comes from, Dante de Leon, Tooth of the Lion in, in French. So you want it, if you turn the leaf on its side it should look like teeth in a jaw and that's what you're looking for. So anything that isn't like that 
um, I would be uh, discarding, particularly at your stage, you should be having a nice flat rosette on the ground, it'll have a little tap root and it has those very distinctive dandelion leaves. Um, the only sort of flat rosette that might be a bit raggy, nowhere near as sharp, that you would definitely want to avoid is ragwort, um, Senecio jacca beer, and that is, it's not going to kill you straight away, and in some old books you might even see it referred to as something you can make a tea from, um, but it contains alkaloids which damage the liver, and that's something that you don't want to be consuming over time. Um, and that is also in the Asteraceae family. But the leaves don't really look like um, dandelion leaves. The overall aspect of the leaf rosettes might be superficially similar to dandelion, but as long as you can recognize a dandelion leaf, you're not gonna make the mistake of confusing one for the other. So I'm hoping that is useful to you and Make sure you get to know the dandelion leaves very well and then you're not going to mistake them for anything else, even if they don't have flowers on. And that brings us to the end of the questions for this episode, episode 50 of Aspore Kirtley. And I can see on the screen it's looking a bit brighter than it actually is in reality now. Um, it's getting a bit dusky now. It's just gone sunset here uh, in in Sussex where I am at the moment the birds are singing at the moment um, spring is really starting to spring properly down here now and it's a great time to be out um, I'm out in the woods for 10 days at the moment um, for various different reasons and I've got a couple of days in between um, running one course and some first aid training that I'm doing uh, that I'm laying on for my team and then we've got some more courses um, and uh, yeah it's a, just a nice time to be out everything's happening we've had deer coming through at night and um, there's a lot of bird life here with owls last night in the trees just above us um, there are buzzards here during the day um, I heard a goshawk yesterday and um, we've had woodpeckers and we've got uh, gold crests up in the trees here and chiff jaffs and it's, it's just lovely everything's just alive at this time of year it's fantastic so i'm going to continue to enjoy my time out and um, hope you enjoy whatever you're doing at the moment if you're in the northern hemisphere and continue to enjoy the spring if you're in the southern hemisphere hope it's a good autumn and um, keep those questions coming um, instagram and twitter have been a bit quiet recently um, emails keep them coming in and remember, there's always speak pipe as well, where you can leave a voice mail question and I can answer them that way as well. And if you enjoy this video, um, then please subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you're watching this on, on, on YouTube, if you're watching this on my blog, it, sign up to the emails because um, then I'm going to send you an email notification. Every time there's new information on my blog, I'll send you an, an email notification. And if you listen to this on a podcast and you're not already subscribing via your favoured podcast app, iTunes or Stitcher or whatever it is that you're listening to this on, make sure that you subscribe so that you get the next episode of Ask Paul Kirtley there waiting for you after it's published. So thanks for your attention. Thanks for listening and stay safe out there and I'll see you on the next episode of Ask Paul Kirtley. Take care.